I would like to introduce our speaker for today. I welcome Lexi Walls, who is a scientist at the University of Washington. Lexi is one of the heroes, I'm very proud to say that, researching on SARS-CoV-2 virus to combat COVID-19 disease. Her work has been foundational for understanding coronavirus structure, especially the spike protein of coronavirus, or otherwise called as the G protein, to understand its function and developing therapeutics before and during the pandemic. She has co-authored more than 28 publications. She has contributed to four US patents, and her work has led to the development of two clinical trials, and she'll be covering that data in her presentation today. Just a little bit of background on Lexi. Lexi is from Massachusetts, and she received her bachelor's in biochemistry from the University of Massachusetts. She moved to Seattle to pursue her PhD with David Wiesler at the University of Washington. And whenever she is not working on SARS-CoV-2 virus or any other coronaviruses, she spends her free time hiking and uh, climbing mountains. So she's pretty active as well. She enjoys nature, uh, which is awesome. So again, uh, before I give the electronic podium to Lexi, um, please remember to submit your questions by typing into the question panel of the GoToWebinar task window. And with that, I will leave the electronic podium to Lexi. So please, Lexi, go ahead. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for that introduction and for, for having me today. And uh, um, I look forward to, to discussing after my presentation. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to, happy to answer them. OK, so like Sahil said, today I'm going to talk about coronaviruses and specifically SARS coronavirus 2. Um, and what I'm really going to focus on is the work that myself and many um, of my coworkers in the Wiesler lab have been working on to really try to visualize what the coronavirus spike looks like just on its own, and then also in complex with neutralizing antibodies and really how we've taken that work and pushed this um, to the clinic. But before I get into that, um, I just wanna back up for a second and talk really about kind of the background of coronaviruses and where we were at the, at the end of um, 20. 2019 when the pandemic was really beginning. And so a, a study was released essentially in October of 2019 saying that, you know, no country, including the U.S., was fully prepared for a pandemic. And this report went largely, you know, un, untalked about, undiscussed. Um, and unfortunately, we're all still currently living the, the consequences of these types of things. Um, and at the end of 2019, there were reports stating that there was kind of a novel virus that was kind of being discovered and was people were trying to understand at the beginning of December. And then towards the end of December, uh, scientists in China were really starting to figure out like what was the cause of this novel pneumonia um, that at the time, you know, there were low, low numbers of people infected and really we had no idea. This was completely novel. And the first thing that they did was to rule out SARS coronavirus. So SARS coronavirus was um, was a infection that jumped from animals to humans back in 2002. This was really quickly brought under control. There were no more, more SARS infections after 2004. SARS was not the first time that coronaviruses jumped from animals to humans. Um, there was actually another instance of this in 2012 with MERS or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Um, MERS is still an active infection with a few hundreds of cases per year. Um, and until er, late last year, there were no therapeutics, no vaccines, nothing really to combat human infecting coronaviruses. And I'll talk, talk to you all today kind of about the work and a lot, a lot of effort has happened globally um, to really change the, the interface of how, how coronaviruses are are therapeutically handled. But going back to the end of 2019 and the, kind of the beginning of 2020, when scientists were trying to figure out what type of virus was this, um, and as soon as they looked at it and started to sequence it, they realized that this was a coronavirus. It was not SARS or severe acute respiratory syndrome, the original um, kind of 
a example of a, a crossover from animals to humans that ended up being really deadly in the modern world. Um, but what they identified was a novel severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2. So now we call it SARS-2. And coronaviruses are really beautiful when you look under the electron microscope. And they're actually named um, corona for this crown of spike glycoproteins that you can see protruding from the edge of the virus. Um, that's really where they get their name. And what I've been working on for the last six years is really to focus on this spike glycoprotein. And there's a number of reasons for doing this. One, that when we started looking at this, there was no structural information about the spike glycoprotein. And the reason that we really wanted to find structural information about this protein is this is one of the only uh, proteins on the surface of coronaviruses um, that the, the immune system really responds to. So majority of neutralizing antibodies um, are really going to this protein. And so we wanted to structurally characterize it. We wanted to understand how do neutralizing antibodies interact with this protein? And what does that look like at the molecular level? So we, we've been using cryo-EM uh, with a mixture of, of crystallography to really understand what are those interactions and what it, how can we dismantle this spike glycoprotein? Um, and so that, that kind of brings us to, to where we are today. And so um, we, we all have been living with this global pandemic of, of SARS coronavirus 2. Um, and this is really an old graphic. It doesn't matter how often I update this, the, the cases are never, never correct. But just to show you a sense of really how global this, this virus has spread um, and how we're all still kind of reeling with, the, with those effects. Now, before I talk about any of the work we've done on SARS coronavirus 2, I just want to show you kind of a summary video that was made by, um, by Janet Owasa, who's a really talented um, scientist scientific animator. Um, and this video is really showing kind of what we knew at the middle to end of 2019 about structure of coronavirus spike proteins in general. And so what I'm showing here is the, the spike protein. It's a trimer and it's heavily glycosylated and you can see that it's present on the, on the surface of the virus. Now what's really interesting is that these receptor binding domains, which you'll see in a second, are actually mobile on the surface. And so they're going between this up and this down conformation. And they're only able to bind their receptor um, when they are in this up conformation. After binding the receptor and undergoing a proteolytic, um, proteolytic activation event, which you could see in orange, um, the spike protein is able to go from its pre-fusion conformation or how it exists on the viral surface into its post-fusion conformation, which you can see depicted here. Now, the purpose of this rearrangement, this amazing uh, structural rearrangement that the spike protein undergoes, is to bring together the viral membrane, which you can see on the bottom, and the host membrane. And this bringing together of these two membranes is really what allows the dissemination of the virus genetic material into the host cell. Now, a lot of work has been done to kind of identify and understand um, what that means for, oops, sorry, what that means for, for the SARS coronavirus 2 spike. So this video was based on a number of other structures prior to 2019, like the structure of SARS coronavirus uh, spike, of MERS coronavirus spike, and of previous structures solved um, like MHV or HKU1 as well. And so Kind of at the beginning of 2020, as soon as the sequence had, was, was released um, and, and everyone was able to start characterizing and identifying the SARS coronavirus 2 spike protein, um, we really got to work to really characterize the structure of the spike. And before I talk about how we characterize the structure of the spike, I want to point out something that we all are hearing a lot about with, um, with regards to, to the current vaccines that are out right now. And so this paper came out in 2017, so long before, long before the pandemic. Um, and this was done um, by a number of groups, um, including um, Andrew Ward, Jason McClellan, and, and Barney Graham's group. And what they identified was really this segment of the spike protein. Um, and so this is really in the interior of the spike protein. And they identified a segment with a, a flexible loop between two helices. And now what's important about this loop is that 
in the prefusion conformation, as it's shown um, up here in, in figure B, this loop is connecting two separate helices. But when the spike refolds into the post-fusion conformation, these helices combine into one long helix. And so what they postulated was, if you could put two prolines right here in that flexible loop, you could potentially prevent the refolding of the spike protein into this long, like one of the pieces into this long helix. Um, and that's exactly what they've shown. And that's exactly what everyone um, in, the, in the coronavirus structural biology field has really adopted ever since this paper. And it's even what the, all, mo many of the vaccines um, that, that many of you may have had the opportunity to receive um, uh, also contain in their, in their sequence. And so what you can see, what they show is that, you know, when you express just SARS spike wild type, you get a mixture of this post-fusion, this really long elongated rod, um, and uh, of course the pre-fusion spike protein, which is this triangular globular um, trimer. However, when they express with what they're calling 2P or 2-proline, what you can see is that nearly 100% of the protein is in this pre-fusion conformation, so as it exists on the viral um, membrane. And they've also done a lot of characterization showing, you know, it's much more stable, so you can get higher yields, um, and, and this is great for a, number of, for a number of reasons. So we took this knowledge and we applied it to, to SARS coronavirus too, as, as many others did as well. Um, and um, and I, I worked really closely um, with, a, with a staff scientist in the lab, his name is Young, um, and we together solved the structure of the SARS coronavirus 2 spike protein. And so what I'm showing you here is just a raw micrograph and 2D class averages of the, of the spike protein that we first, that we first solved. Um, and at this point, we were working really, really quickly um, to, to, to try and get information as quickly as possible. So literally the exact same day that I purified this protein, I handed it off to Young and he froze instantly. And so what you're looking at is a continuous thin carbon grid um, over lacy carbon um, that he collected on the, on the Creos with a K2. Um, and what he was able to get from this, from this beautiful data set, we collected quite a large data set. We had a, um, a little over 4,000 images. Um, and what he was able to see is, is truly the structure of the, the SARS coronavirus spike protein. And you can see that it's a trimer. So each monomer is colored um, in a different color, um, in blue, yellow, and pink. And what we found from this data set was that we had a large number of the spikes in a closed conformation. So all of the receptor binding domains um, are in a down conformation. In the exact same data set, we were able to pull out some up receptor binding domains, which I'm highlighting here with an arrow. You can see that this blue domain, um, this receptor binding domain, is slightly ajar compared to the version on the left. And this was a little different from what we had seen previously with um, SARS coronavirus spike protein and MERS coronavirus spike protein. Those two spikes we really saw in majority of open conformation. So mostly we had two receptor binding domains up. We even had three receptor binding domains up. Um, but SARS-2 definitely seemed, the spike protein seemed a little more closed um, compared to those. Other than that major difference, though, um, we really wanted to look, you know, from at the, at the protein level, SARS-2 is very closely related to um, SARS coronavirus, the original SARS coronavirus. Um, it's much more closely related to other, um, you know, bat or animal coronaviruses, but from what we had structurally at the time, SARS coronavirus was really the, the closest spike that it was related to. And, and largely, other than that difference in the receptor binding domains, in the up versus down propensity of the receptor binding domain, the organization of the spike protein and largely all of the domains are, are really similar between SARS coronavirus 2 and SARS coronavirus 1. The organization of the receptor binding domain subunit, so the S1 subunit, you know, we still have this, this nice V shape, and the S2 subunit, which is even more highly conserved than the S1 subunit, um, is structurally virtually unchanged. Now, at the beginning of 2020, 
even though we knew we knew that SARS coronavirus two was mostly what was most closely related to SARS coronavirus one, um, many people were postulating, um, you know, what the what the receptor binding domain, what the receptor, um, sorry, was of uh, of this novel coronavirus, and it was later shown um, structurally and also um, biochemically that the receptor is ACE two. Now this receptor is exactly the same as the receptor that is used by SARS coronavirus one. And interestingly, it's also the exact same receptor used by another um, human infecting coronavirus called NL63. NL63 causes um, common cold-like symptoms in, in people, and it's virtually impossible to find someone who has never encountered um, NL63. So we've all previously been infected and, and, um, and in general just had common cold-like symptoms. So, SARS coronavirus 2, we know uses the ACE2 as its receptor. Um, and one thing we wanted to kind of identify as we're thinking, you know, we have this pandemic underway and we're really trying to identify, okay, where are the neutralizing antibodies that target this SARS coronavirus 2 spike going? Where can we find potential solutions to these infections? And so we teamed up with, um, with QMABs and Veer, Veer Bio, um, a, a company that's split between the US and, and Italy, uh, sorry, and Switzerland. And we really started to identify where antibodies from people who had previously been infected were targeted. And so that's what I'm showing on this next slide. So all the way on the left, we have antibodies from hospitalized people, from symptomatic people, from asymptomatic but known um, positive cases, and from um, samples previously taken before the pandemic. So they should never have encountered um, SARS coronavirus 2. They may have encountered other, they probably encountered other coronaviruses, but never SARS coronavirus 2. And what we can see is that there are really a lot of, and so this is an, an ELISA. What we can see is there's really a lot of antibodies going to the spike with more antibodies in a hospitalized um, cohort than in, than in the symptomatic and then even less so in asymptomatic. And what we can further see is as we kind of narrow into the spike, that the majority of the antibodies that are targeting the spike are likely targeting that receptor binding domain. So the portion of the spike that really interacts with ACE2. And what we can further show is not just that majority of the antibodies that are targeting the spike bind to the receptor binding domain, but also that majority of the neutralizing potential of these antibodies is held in those that bind to the receptor binding domain. So what we can do is we can show that if we deplete all antibodies or close to all antibodies that bind to the receptor binding domain, we can show, you know, previously we have a large number of antibodies binding to the receptor binding domain. Following depletion, we've lost, you know, a hundred or a thousand fold of those, of those um, antibodies that bind. And then we can look at the exact same samples in neutralization. And so you can see that previously these samples were able to potently neutralize the SARS coronavirus to pseudovirus. And then following depletion, we're losing about 90% of the ability to neutralize the virus. And this has been shown by many other groups since, the, since, um, since this paper came out, and what this means is that majority of the ability to neutralize SARS coronavirus 2 is coming from antibodies that are targeting the receptor binding domain. And so this was really exciting. You know, we started to have an answer of where we could target to really understand the immune response. However, when you look at sarbicovirus spike proteins and you look at the structure, unfortunately, the most conserved region is down here in what we call the S2 subunit, or really the, the region that's responsible for membrane fusion. This is the region that, um, that contains that 2P mutation, so preventing the refolding from the pre to post fusion. But if you look on top where the receptor binding domains are engaging with the receptor, you can see that among sarbicoviruses, which includes SARS coronavirus 1, SARS coronavirus 2, and many of the related um, animal. Um, coronaviruses, you can see that there's quite a lot of variation in this receptor binding domain. And so one question we had was, are 
receptor binding domain antibodies that are neutralizing for SARS coronavirus 2, is there any conservation or is there any ability for cross reactivity? And so one way that we looked at this, so at the beginning of the pandemic, we, we of course were trying to find anything that we could that could potentially help um, therapeutically against SARS coronavirus 2. And the first thing that we did was we said, well, we have mice that have previously been infected, er, sorry, been immunized with, um, with the SARS coronavirus 1 spike protein. And we had previously shown, you know, when you have just the SARS coronavirus virus, you get 100% entry. And when you add the plasma from any of the mice that have been immunized specifically with the SARS coronavirus spike, you get 100% um, blockage of virus entry. And so what that means is that these mice have raised neutralizing antibodies against the SARS coronavirus um, spike. And so we were wondering, these exact same plasma from these mice that have been immunized with SARS coronavirus 1, how well were they able to neutralize SARS coronavirus 2? And so that's the next experiment that we did. And while you can see it's not 100%, we still have an extremely large drop from, you know, from entry of SARS coronavirus pseudovirus just on its own. And then addition of this, sera of this plasma really blocks about 90% of the entry. And so since we knew that majority of the neutralizing capability comes from the receptor binding domain, we were, we were excited to start looking and see what cross-reactive receptor binding antibodies are there. And if there are some cross-reactivity, can we use this therapeutically? And what can we learn about this structurally? And how are they able to neutralize potentially both SARS-1 and SARS-2? And so again, teaming up with, um, with VIRBIO, um, we started looking at, um, at uh, human antibodies. So we were looking in the memory B cells um, to really identify monoclonals that potentially had the ability to bind to both the SARS coronavirus 1 spike and the SARS coronavirus 2 spike. And so that's exactly what you're looking at here. You're just looking at binding, so not neutralization. But what we can clearly see is that there are a number of, re of receptor binding domain directed antibodies that can bind both SARS-1 and SARS-2. And you can see that there's, there's differences between them. So if we just look at this light blue triangle, you know, we have really weak binding against SARS coronavirus 1. But if you look at the light blue triangle against SARS coronavirus 2, it's actually better at binding SARS coronavirus 2. And we have examples going both directions, right? We have this open dark square, which really doesn't bind SARS coronavirus 2, or it does extremely weakly. And yet it's one of the best binders against SARS coronavirus 1. So there, we're already teasing out clear differences in kind of the landscape of both of these spike proteins. And so we wanted to start um, picking some of these antibodies to structurally characterize and to figure out, you know, what of these, which of these antibodies could really contribute to neutralization? How is it doing that at the structural level? And if these are potent and broad, can we translate them to the clinic? And so the first type of antibodies that we looked at were, were did we have any that were blocking the receptor binding interaction? So right here in this schematic, I just have the receptor binding domain shown and where ACE2 is binding. And so the first way that we look at this is through um, biolayer interferometry. And so this is basically just a competition assay. We load ACE2 onto a, onto a BLI biolayer infer interferometry tip. And then we say, okay, then can we dip this tip that's bound with ACE2 into the receptor binding domain? Yes, we get tons of binding because ACE2 is the receptor. What if we preload this receptor binding domain with an antibody that we suspect blocks ACE2 binding? And what you can see in purple here is that if we've preloaded this receptor binding domain with this antibody S2H13, um, you can no longer see any binding of the receptor binding domain, suggesting that you know, this antibody is, is really blocking that interface. And we then went on to, ca to characterize that structurally. And we found two, uh, we've now found many, but at this point we found two antibodies that you can see really bind in two completely different ways but both still block the ACE2 interaction, um, which is really occurring right at this tip here. And just to go into a little bit of the structural characterization details, so um, we 
we were able to really look and do some focus classification and symmetry and refinement to really look at the, the antibody RBD interface, which is really the most important for picking out, you know, how is this, how is this antibody interacting with the receptor binding domain? And through this, we were able to really improve um, the structure and really be able to build um, in this map. And now, we typically find that when the receptor binding domains are closed, we have a much, we have a much more tractable structural system. Um, but I just want to show that we don't only see the antibodies binding um, when they're when the um, when there is all the receptor binding domains are closed. In fact, these antibodies require the the receptor binding domains to be more open and in a more open position. And so we can also show that when we have um, you know an, a receptor binding domain open, we can see that there's a lot um, more structural variability and that it's a, a lot more difficult for us to really capture this um, upon upon cryoEM but we can with extensive classification get to you know a moderate resolution of specifically these open um, receptor binding domains and so this is just one class of antibody that we can structurally characterize using cryo electron microscopy microscopy and so we also wanted to see are there other antibodies binding into different zones that are also neutralizing um, on the receptor binding domain? And so again, we found kind of another class of antibodies. And so what I'm going to show first is just that we have these three antibodies, one in pink, one in yellow, and one in purple, that are all binding kind of to this outer, um, outer side of the receptor binding domain away from specifically from the receptor binding domain site. However, what we notice is that of these three antibodies, so purple being the farthest from the ACE2 receptor binding domain site, sorry, ACE2 receptor site, and pink being the closest, we found that as you got further and further from kind of the interaction between ACE2 and the SARS-2 receptor, you got worse and worse at neutralizing the virus, suggesting that potentially one of the mechanisms that these antibodies use to neutralize the virus is really by sterically blocking ACE2 from interacting. Um, and we, we hypothesize that because as you get further and further away, so this purple really has no interaction with ACE2, it's, it becomes a much weaker um, neutralizer. Whereas the previous class of antibodies that I've shown directly blocks ACE2, that is likely the major mechanism for how these antibodies work. And one other really interesting um, observation about these antibodies is because these antibodies are really only able to bind when the receptor binding domain is open, something that we've noticed is that, you know, as the receptor binding domains open, they become, the, the spike protein becomes less stable. And we can actually capture this using cryoelectron microscopy and what that kind of looks like is we get the release of the S1 subunit. So imagine chopping the protein kind of right in the middle here. And what you can see, and this is just one example of one of these um, classes of antibodies, you can see in, in light pink and dark purple that the antibody is still bound in this S1 released structure. And we kind of see this with all of these antibodies that require the opening of the of the receptor binding domain. And so you can see the trimer of the spike protein in yellow, blue, and light pink. And then you can see where the antibody has really engaged um, on the top. And what's interesting to us is this is happening, you know, even though we have a two proline stabilized spike protein, really suggesting that these antibodies are driving and forcing um, forcing the, the receptor binding domains to stay open and in a really unstable position, um, which is potentially another mechanism um, or way that they kind of, quote, destroy the spike protein. There's one more class of antibody that we really um, have identified through all of this work with VIR, um, and that is one that binds to kind of this front side of the receptor binding domain. And again, it's very far away from the ACE2 receptor binding site. And so what's really interesting about this antibody, and this antibody is called S309, is that it neutralizes extremely potently without blocking the ACE2 receptor interaction. 
and it also binds to an extremely conserved site on the receptor binding domain. And this antibody um, has done really, really well in, in clinical trials is, and is um, and what's really exciting is that in this zone, there's no major mutations that have been popping up um, naturally among um, circulating SARS coronavirus 2 variants. And so through all of this structural characterization, so we've kind of identified these three classes of, of antibodies, we've, through cryo-EM, made an antigenic map and basically defined a landscape of neutralization of SARS-2 with, um, with these varying classes of, of antibodies. And so with all of this knowledge, we kind of started to ask, our, ask ourselves, can we make a vaccine that takes the in information from these antibodies that occur naturally um, in, in patients who have been infected either with SARS-1 or SARS-2? And can we take this information and really build a vaccine that targets these known sites responsible for 90% of neutralizing activity and really highlight that in our vaccine? And so that was kind of the question that, that we set out to address, and we teamed up with, um, with Neil King and the University of Washington Institute for Protein Design really to do this. And again, I'm gonna show a video from Janet Owasa um, just kind of displaying um, what, we've, what we've done here. And so again, we have the SARS coronavirus 2 virus um, kind of displayed here with the spike proteins on the surface, glycosylated and with their receptor binding domains moving from, you know, from an up and a down um, uh, presentation. And so we knew that we wanted to highlight the spike um, in, in our vaccine and specifically the receptor binding domain. And so what we did is we fused this receptor binding domain to a scaffold, which trimerized the receptor binding domain. And then in collaboration with Neil King's group, we put this scaffold um, onto an existing nano cage. And so this nano cage is made with two designed components, one in gray, which is the trimeric component, and one in orange, which is a pentameric component. And so what this allows us to do is really to, to display 60 copies of the receptor binding domain on a nano cage platform um, to use an, as an immunogen. And I'm just going to show that kind of a little bit slower here. So we have 20 copies of the receptor binding domain of SARS-2 used to a trimer, and then we have the pentamer that assembles into this beautiful um, nano cage. And we can look at this by negative stain electron microscopy, and we can characterize it also by cryo-electron microscopy and see really that um, we have these beautiful homogeneous nano cages that are displaying the receptor binding domain. And what we showed towards the end of last year was that this receptor binding domain elicits extremely high, potent, high and potent neutralizing response in mice. And so what I'm showing here is the receptor binding domain on its own, all the way to the left, um, is not able to elicit a neutralizing response, at least at these low doses. And so the goal of using low doses is you have more potential more vaccines for more people. The spike on its own, so the S2P trimer, SARS-2 spike, um, is able to elicit a neutralizing response, but only at a higher dose, so at five micrograms. And no matter what we did to the nanophage, whether we had a short or a long linker, and whether we had a low valency, so 50% of the, of the receptor binding domains occupied or 100, we really were able to get high neutralizing titers against SARS coronavirus 2 um, at extremely low doses, so up to one microgram um, of the nanocage. And this was doing much better than just the S2P spike on its own and much better than native infection, which you can see here in orange with the human convalescent serum. And not only were they able to elicit highly potent neutralizing titers, they also protected mice um, from infection with mouse-adapted SARS coronavirus 2. So what you can see is that um, the, the receptor binding domain has full infection. There, we can detect viral RNA copies in, in the nose and lungs. The low dose of the SARS-2 uh, spike, the 2P spike protein, has some breakthrough as well. The high dose of the spike protein is fully protected, and all doses and all iterations of the receptor binding domain nanoparticle are fully protected in mice. 
Now, not only are they fully protected and eliciting really high, um, high titers at, an, at a low dose, but we also showed that we're really targeting many different locations on the receptor binding domain nanoparticle. So we're getting antibodies that block ACE2, which we can see through this BLI um, competition assay, where as we add purified polyclonal uh, fabs, we can actually block the, the binding of ACE2, which the native binding is in black here. We can do the same thing with CR3022, which is mimicking um, you know, similar style of antibodies to the three that I showed earlier. And we can also show this for S309, which is um, the, the back end receptor binding domain antibody that is, in, that is moving quickly through clinical trials. And so we can elicit this really broad response. And the goal of knowing that we have this broad response is you know, we have all of these variants coming, uh, kind of popping up everywhere. And so the, the kind of goal of this type of vaccine is if we have a broad response, especially we're eliciting antibodies like S309, which bind um, to a zone that has so far not been mutated, the goal is that no matter what antibodies kind of, or sorry, no matter what um, variants are, are coming, that we have antibodies that are broad enough to still prevent infection even in the face of these mutations. Now, that's not the only way that we're trying to, you know, make this vaccine broad and ready for potential variants. We're also making what we call mosaic or, or cocktail receptor binding domain nanoparticles. And so the way that we're doing this is we're putting various receptor binding domains. So we have SARS-2, which was our previous um, vaccine, which is currently in phase one clinical trials. Um, but we're also putting other related uh, Sarbacovirus or family of SARS-1 and SARS-2 receptor binding domains on this nanoparticle platform. And so we've chosen in this first iteration um, four different receptor binding domains. So SARS coronavirus 2 receptor binding domain, SARS 1, and then a SARS 1 related um, bat uh, coronavirus, WIV 1, and then a SARS 2 related bat coronavirus, RATG 13. And so we've put this into both a mosaic, which means that we have a mixture of all of these receptor binding domains um, present on a single nanoparticle. And we've also um, tried to see in cocktail form, you know, we have uh, just RATG13, just SARS2, just SARS1, and just WIV1 all injected into mice at the same time, and really to kind of identify how this is going. And so I just want to end with one final video showing that, you know, we're currently testing these, um, these mosaic and cocktail nanoparticles, but the goal is really to see, like, we have all of these variants coming out, and if we can put you know, a variety of these receptor binding domain variants onto a single nanoparticle, so this is um, showing an example of a mosaic nanoparticle, the goal would be that we elicit broad neutralizing antibodies, not just against whatever um, sequence is present in the vaccine, but also antibodies that can tackle you know, the next variant that we don't even know whether it's come out yet. So the goal is, you know, you have these broadly binding antibodies that can really block entry of the, of the virus, even if the vaccine doesn't even contain um, these receptor binding domain, domain strains. And so we just put this on BioArchive and we're, we're excited to see, you know, where this goes. Um, but this is kind of the future of how we use structure to understand antibodies to then um, take these structures and take these interactions of known neutralizing antibodies with the receptor binding domain and push them into a clinical vaccine candidate. And so just to, to briefly summarize what I've talked to you about today, kind of what we've done over the past year is we've mapped monoclonal antibodies using cryo-electron microscopy and x-ray crystallography to the receptor binding domain, the region where 90% of neutralizing activity against SARS coronavirus 2 is, and we've used this to propel um, monoclonal antibodies into the clinic and also a vaccine candidate into the clinic. And this would not have been possible without first determining the structure of the SARS coronavirus 2 spike in its multiple conformations and understanding that there's really a, a wealth of data showing that there are cross-neutralizing antibodies 
um, that target the receptor binding domain, and these are potent, and we can bring these um, towards therapeutic uses. And so with that, I first have to thank everyone in the Visa lab. This honestly is even an old photo. We've continuously been growing over the, over the, um, over the pandemic, um, but I really wanna highlight, so Young has done a lot of the structural characterization work um, that, that I've shown today. Um, and then of course, David has been a fantastic mentor. I've, we've worked together for the past five or six years. Um, and he's really, you know, taught me everything I know about uh, about cryo-electron microscopy and about scientific discovery. And then I've also shown you a lot of work that has been collaborative which, with a lot of different groups. And so I just want to highlight um, the major players here. So I talked a lot about our work in collaboration with Humabs and VierBio, um, where they do a lot of antibody discovery and characterization. And we've been doing a lot of the structural characterization and biophysical characterization. We've worked um, with collaborators at um, Fred Hutch here in Seattle. And then of course, our large collaboration with the University of Washington Institute for Protein Design to really get these um, protein designed nanoparticles displaying the receptor binding domain um, um, into, into phase one clinical trials with, with, um, with their, their design. And then the challenge work that I showed was done um, in Ralph Barrett's lab at the University of North Carolina. Um, and I will end there and um, just remind everyone how to, how to submit questions, I think. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to take any questions that, that you all may, may have. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lexi, for such a beautiful talk. Uh, again, I would remind everyone present here today to submit your questions by typing in the question panel right here, uh, as Lexi was suggesting. Um, and again, um, do not uh, hesitate to ask any questions, anything about latitude or anything that I presented or anything Lexi presented. So Lexi, we do have some questions here, if you don't mind answering. So the question is, how do the variants or mutations in SARS-CoV-2 virus would affect the landscape of the monoclonal antibodies or the vaccines that has been developed so far? Yeah, um, so this is something that pretty much everyone in the field is thinking of and honestly trying also to predict in a way, you know, the, the virus, you know, up until kind of mid, mid 2020 seemed to have kind of a stable sequence. And since then we've kind of, with increased sequencing efforts and, and a lot of work done, um, we've been finding that there are a lot of novel um, uh, variants really coming out. Um, and so there are a lot of variants that um, we're all kind of noticing and worried about. So the first is B117, which originated or was originally sequenced in the United Kingdom. Um, and this sequence has kind of been taking over because it has been shown to have slightly increased infectivity. Now, the increased infectivity and potentially also increased um, you know, clinical signs is really detrimental. However, um, the, the mutations in the spike protein really are not affecting the landscape of a immune response. They do knock out some of the monoclonal antibodies. So there's a mutation on the receptor binding domain called 501Y. Um, some of the monoclonals are knocked out by this, but overall, um, a, an immune response from a vaccine or from prior infection um, seems to still be able to handle this B117 totally fine. That is not true for all of the variants though. Um, there are a couple of variants, so one named B1351 and one named P1. So these um, originated or were originally sequenced in South Africa and Brazil respectively. Um, these have a kind of a smattering of mutations that does seem to lower the overall immune response. Many of the monoclonal receptor binding domain antibodies are knocked out through these um, mutations, and there does seem to be a drop in immune response. So these are kind of the ones that we're, we're looking at and we're worried about. Um, and then there's even more coming out like daily that we're, we're really trying to focus on. So another one that we've characterized is um, B1427, which was originally sequenced in California. Again, certain uh, of the monoclonal antibodies are completely abrogated um, 
not just in the receptor binding domain, but also in the N terminal domain, which I didn't have time to talk about today, um, but also has neutralization capability. Um, and again, kind of the polyclonal response, so after vaccination or, or infection, there is a drop from this B1427 that originate, was originally found in California. Um, so we're constantly learning, but that's kind of why we in the field are looking at monoclonal antibodies like S309, which bind to a region that so far we haven't found naturally occurring mutations to, or we're really driving this, you know, this receptor binding domain nanoparticle. We're showing that we can have broad responses, and we're also trying to even broader, broaden those responses further for future vaccines. So we're aware of it and we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for answering this question. Uh, let's see if we have another question. Um, what challenges did you face with respect to SARS-CoV-2 spike protein with and without the antibody fragments or FABs uh, in terms of sample heterogeneity? Yeah. Um, so, kind of, I'll just go back to this slide. So, kind of the first aspect of sample heterogeneity that um, everyone in the coronavirus field is dealing with is, you know, the core of the spike will refine to extremely high resolution. However, the N-terminal domains and the receptor binding domain, so receptor binding domain, I have this up arrow to, and then directly next to it um, is the, you know, the N-terminal domains. And these are really flexible. The receptor binding domain is literally moving from a down to an up conformation. And as a result, the whole S1 subunit is really breathing, um, making it a really challenging um, structural target. Now we can use focus classification and ex honestly extensive classification to really put all of the particles that are fully down into one bin, use a C3 um, symmetry to refine. But the, the different receptor binding domain characterizations, you know, these have to be done with C1 symmetry and they, and the refinement is definitely not as high of resolution because of that. In some instances, having a, an antibody fragment helps stabilize this segment. And in some instances, it gives it even more motion. So it, it's kind of a mixed bag whether they help or hurt um, certain zones, but definitely extensive classification um, and, and focused uh, classification is kind of our friend here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Lexi. We have another question. How will your vaccine be delivered, uh, for example, with respect to other vaccine from mRNA, Pfizer, or Johnson & Johnson? Yeah, um, so right now it's it's kind of the same, the exact same method, so intramuscular. Um, we would love to have, you know, a, a fully aerosolized spray um, and working towards it, but definitely for right now, uh, similar injection to, to the mRNA. Um, or um, or adenovirus platforms, um, and we're currently testing two doses, so basically exactly the same as all other vaccines on the on the market right now. So, Lexi, I have another question for you. Um, yeah. Have you ever compared your RBD nanoparticles versus the currently available vaccines? Um, yes. So uh, we we have looked just at you know um, human. Uh, Sarah from vaccinated individuals like Pfizer and Moderna. Um, it's hard to directly compare since none of our samples are currently, in, or we have not been, we do not have access to the human samples yet. Um, but what we have been doing is benchmarking against similar um, style uh, vaccines. So we've been benchmarking against protein uh, SARS-2 spike or um, protein hexapro, which is an even further stabilized um, spike protein. Um, and what we see is that the immune response, at least in non-human primates, is very, very similar. So we're getting to similar neutralization titers, similar amounts of breadth. So, you know, against different variants, um, the receptor binding domain looks very, very similar to a spike-based vaccine. Um, and we think the reason for that is one, that most of the neutralization capacity is coming from the receptor binding domain. Um, and two, because we're presenting just the receptor binding domain, we may even be getting more benefit of types of antibody, like breadth of receptor binding domain style antibodies. Um, and that may be an advantage over some of the spike protein based um, vaccines. <laughs> 
but yeah, it's, okay. a, it's a great question. Uh, thank you, Lexi. So for the sake of time, I think we'll take the rest of the questions offline. Again, if you have submitted any question, uh, we'll be sending you an email with the answer to your question. With that, I thank you, Lexi, for giving such a beautiful talk. And I thank everyone present here today for their time and attending the webinar series. Thank you. Thank you so much.